All right, everyone, let's get started. So welcome to my session, ITDR and where it fits in your identity security stack. Uh, my name is Brian Friedman. I work for a company called Complex. I do solutions architecture with them. Been with them for a little over three years at this point, working in the identity space. Um, before I worked for Complex, I worked in the EDR realm. I worked for a company called Silence. And we did cool stuff around AI, malware, ransomware, attack detection, great stuff in that space. And before that, I was a lonely government drone building out socks for the US federal government, which is as soul sucking as it sounds. Um, to kick this off, really, I want to kind of get a good idea of the audience and really what is the makeup of the room and the people we have here. So of course, this is Identiverse. We all know identity. But I want to know where you guys come from. So just by a show of hands, who here works on the infrastructure operations side of the house for their companies? OK, handful. Who here works on the security side? They report up the security realm. OK. We had about 60, 40 here, which actually kind of lends itself to what I'm seeing across the space around how in this category, in identity security as a whole, we're seeing this strange kind of convergence of identity players on the ops side moving into the security realm as identity becomes a core security component of any organization. So as we kind of go through this talk, there's really kind of three main things I really want to work you guys through. One, we need to talk about identity as a core attack factor. For many, many years, uh, probably last six to eight, I would say, the main focus of security companies has really kind of been the basics. You know, I want to make sure I do centralized log management. Is everything reporting to my SIM? Things like that to then a heavy focus on malware, viruses, think your AV, EDR type solutions. Lately, it's all pivoted uh, in a couple different ways. One, because attackers are changing what they're doing to make it easier to exploit companies. But then also, two, just vendors need to respond to that. And we're seeing a change on how companies are responding to those types of threats from an organizational perspective, a technology perspective, and a tactical perspective. So we want to talk about it. Gardner has also lended itself and brought its opinion to the world around these items as well. So they've created this new, I don't want to call it a category yet because it's not a full on quadrant, but it is a category of solutions or capabilities that we want to be able to talk and that CISOs, people on both the infrastructure side and the security side need to start thinking around of ITDR, Identity Threat Detection and Response. Quick show of hands, who is familiar with the ITDR concept so far? OK, 50%. And who's heard of zero trust? Everybody. Perfect. OK. So we want to talk about how ITDR applies, how we need to focus, how can we use it, how can we operationalize it, how can we be tactical and think, what can I actually do in my organization to actually do something meaningful? I don't want to lead a thought exercise. I want you guys to leave with an idea of what do I want to do, what can I bring, what can I go home or really go back to work next week and start doing something. Um, I want to make sure you guys have that sense as we exit this talk. We'll talk about some options and, of course, questions and answers. So there we go. For those who kind of don't understand the identity threat factor, um, if you're familiar with Verizon, they have this thing called the Defense Breach Incident Response, or DBI report. It's all about threats they've seen across their entire customer base, Verizon being a massive telecom and also having a very massive security org underneath it, MSSP, where they respond to threats as a whole. And they categorize, log, manage, and actually provide some really insightful analytics in terms of trends they see across their vast customer base. As part of that, they found that, you know, of course, people are being attacked. Like, we all know that happens. But we're seeing stolen credentials lead to nearly 50% of attacks, which is a huge factor. And this leads to kind of a change in how we talk about threats. It's not I'm being hacked or organizations aren't being uh, actively exploited. Attackers are logging into networks they want to compromise because their credentials are already out there. We see this a couple different ways too, not just on the local level, small businesses, medium-sized businesses that would use Verizon services. We see it at the big level too. We look at events like SolarWinds, big government agencies, all compromised, and a core vector of that for the spread of this was AD exploitation. And we saw in the actual review of this in FireEye actually did a great you know, uh, piece around how this attack worked, foundationally what happened on the back end. The code was reviewed. It was amazing. 
But they talked about here, and this key point here, of if a system was not joined to AD, it just stopped. It had no way to proliferate. It wasn't moving through networks. So which means we're seeing here is that attackers, big and small, are using identity as a way to move laterally through networks, to get around to organizations or assets that are important, to things that you would pay a million dollars to actually have released back to you. Now, a quick show of hands. Who's familiar with SolarWinds? They've heard of it, they've seen it. Okay, all of it, so we won't talk about it. Don't want to waste people's time. Now, when it comes to how people are refactoring identity back into what we already know and love, right, as security practitioners, is we see this as core components of actually malware these days. Now, commonly people come in, or actually malware be created to find initial attack factor. I was able to exploit XYZ software, or this new CVE, something came through, Lockbit, Hive, Vice Society, um, you swing by the CrowdStrike booth, they can talk to you all about this stuff. They're in great EDR right there. But what we're seeing is this malware is being reused repeatedly in different ways, but also in ways to further exploit identity, taking that initial vector of breach, then also using that to then bolt on identity components, to allowing people and attackers to then further move through the system. On the second side of this too, right, we also see another statistic here. 2022, 26 million user credentials were stolen. That's people using corporate credentials in, you know, commercial websites, Last.fm, Spotify, Facebook.com. We see this all the time. And this is leading to more and more attackers just logging in, further exploiting networks just simply because they can log into networks. If we think about controls around this, what do I have in my security stack today that can stop this type of thing? If someone logs into my network, what do you have that can actually prevent that? Anyone, any ideas? What? Risk, risk what? Risk yeah, we have UEBIT tools that look for risky behavior. Anybody else? Anything that starts with an M? There we go. Anything around encryption, DLP? We think about your classic EDR tools, of course. We think about honeypot tools. They're all out there. When people log into these networks, these tools generally fall flat. And we think about the premise of it too. If I have authorized access into a network, so I have stolen credentials from, I don't know, some guy named Rob. I log in and I'm now on an asset. I'm on a directory. I'm in the, the network. DLP will assume I'm Rob. So I have access to all Rob's content, all Rob's files, any services that he's already authorized to. It's often very easy to find out what I already have access to because this is already stored in Active Directory. I can see the groups, the relationships, all very easy to explore with some simple built-in Windows utilities. Um, malware, it's not going to bat an eye. Or sorry, AV, antivirus, EDR, not going to bat an eye because I logged in. I'm not a threat. I'm not malware. I'm not code. I logged into the network, so am I actually something to respond to? Encryption type tools, you know, secure the data at rest secure data at transit. That tooling also is going to fall flat. We think about, I logged in, it now assumes an identity, it gives me access to those files, access to those drives, access to that data, because it knows I am Rob, or it assumes that I am Rob because I, I logged in, I have to be correct. And so we're finding that being able to detect these things is just simply a hard and difficult problem, especially when it comes to identity, which where zero trust comes in. Now we've seen, and we all have talked about zero trust. It's a massive buzzword here at this conference. We've been talking about it a lot. Even the White House has actually put out something around zero trust, zero trust initiatives, moving the federal government to go and comply with zero trust. When we talk about zero trust, I think we all need to have a common language around it. And there's a lot of different principles out there. Every big organization out there is going to have their take on it. I like to go to Microsoft because identity, foundational element, Tied back to Active Directory is a foundational element of a lot of enterprises. So not just Active Directory, but I also include Azure AD as well. Many of you guys are assume or are in some varying stage of your cloud migration journey. Moving into cloud in some capacity, using Azure AD, you have remote users, you need to account for them. So we need to be able to make sure we're aligned to the people who are the vendors of that technology. So it always comes down to this little section here. Do I have a laser? Yeah. Never trust, always verify. 
And that's in any access of any resource or object in the network. So verify, use least privilege, we all know about that. And then assume breach, which I also love too. This echoes a lot of the sentiment that exists in the EDR realm. I need to prevent what I need to prevent, but I need to detect when I'm actively being exploited. And I need to know how to do that. So never trust, but verify. So let's think of an example of this. I log in, I'm a legitimate user, I'm not an attacker. I need to access XYZ spreadsheet, doesn't really matter. I need to verify that I am who I say I am. I need to make sure I have access to the spreadsheet. Is it on a shared drive? All those elements too. Verify those things. Those are all premises of zero trust. The unfortunate thing is there's nothing I can plug into a network that says you're now zero trust compliant. You now have been uh, enabled with zero trust. You've been granted all the zero trust principles. You are now zero trustable. Nothing like that exists because it's a series of both uh, operational components. It's a multitude of technology that need to work together. And it also involves configuration on a large scale for organizations. Now, when we think about technology, right, MFA is good. This slide is a little bit misdeceiving. I probably should use a little bit softer language here, but MFA is a component in any defense and depth strategy that we need to think about. And it's so easily bypassable for a lot of different categories depending on the technology. Now, I am not here to um, talk negatively about any MFA vendor. I know there's a ton here. MFA is great for defense and depth as always, but it is bypassable, especially when you think about um, just natural human behavior. We've seen from groups like Lapsus around if I spam a million prompts to a user at three o'clock in the morning, they'll just hit yes eventually just to make it stop so they can move on. We see these types of information here, not on any secret websites. This type of stuff, the screenshots, I got them from Twitter. They're out there very easily to see and you can kind of talk about it. If you want more Twitter information around MFA and issues people have in implementing and managing it, reach out to me after the show. Happy to share what I got with you on this one. The other side of the MFA equation too is around your other accounts, non-user-based accounts. Think service accounts, things that you can't really add an additional token to because there's no actual human behind it. We think about lapses and how they come in and they look and use tools to kind of go in and explore, find data, treasure troves, and exfiltrate that out. Components of that is they like to avoid humans because, well, service accounts tend to own high value data, but then also too, you can't step up off. There's no token. There's nothing you can go to, which make them notoriously difficult to protect as well. Now, questions so far around the premise, around identity, around where we're going with this, because I want to talk about how we can respond to things too. Okay. So identity is targeted left and right around the board. With the cloud migration that everyone's going through, think IT transformation, things like this, Everyone's moving to hybrid, even companies and organizations that are notoriously hard set on on-premise entirely. You need to do business via the cloud. You need to have access via the cloud. There are components of cloud you need to start involving. So we have some organizations that are cloud native. AWS loves cloud native companies. We see some organizations that are slowly moving it, exposing public facing services that way. But when you do that, you also expand your attack surface. And this is the natural component of cloud. Being able to know and understand I have disparate users accessing my data or my information, my products, my services from many different ways. We also all know about COVID, work from home, people have been around the block. It's just you have a very undefined user boundary as well, and we need to solve for that as well. And we think about the defense systems here as part of this. Again, we want to layer defense and death strategy. So again, we want to encourage the use of EDR. We want to encourage the use of AV, MFA, very important. But we also need to go back to the principles of hygiene, looking how we can detect and how we can respond to threats as they occur. So that includes things of open source tooling is available, think Bloodhound, Sharphound type stuff. There's also being able to run your teams and security ops for the security folks. I think it's all mostly we're over here. Being able to be able to test against, can I detect certain threats? So we saw back here, can I detect a DC sync attack? Can I detect invocation of Mimikatz? Can I detect a variety of Mimi Cat's distributions? I think the last time I checked, I saw there was over 68 different versions of Mimi Cat's. Is your AV or EDR caught up with all of those? Right? Can we pick some and test that? We want to be able to be able to manage those types of things here. And then also too, what do I do for response? Now, the reason why I asked that question early in the um, talk here of who's on the operation side versus who's on security side. 
is because these two orgs need to start talking to each other a lot more. For this talk, I want everyone to consider themselves part of the security team. Because as part of the security org, you understand threats. You understand what's going on. You understand what certain attack vectors are or why attackers would exploit certain things. From the operations side, the infrastructure side, you're very much concerned around usability, ease of access, reducing friction, compliance with my actual security controls, non-exemption, standardization, these are all things you care about. You understand how to configure items where a security person may not natively understand that. And especially in a realm of identity where we see a unique, um, almost like a little bit of a knowledge space, a knowledge gap, purely because security practitioners have been focusing so much on AV and EDR, malware threats, ransomware for so many years, while identity folks have been really focused on SAML, extension to the cloud, frictionless user, SSO, um, multi-factor, right? Enablement of those tools and extensibility to make user processes much simpler. Now, we kind of talked about this, and uh, I have a natural thing where I tend to do where I talk ahead of my slides, but we talk about security tech that's kind of involved, what people have generally been using over time. PAM, MFA, IGA, IM, SIM. Again, all great techs. I want to encourage layering, but I think it's important to differentiate what those tools are doing for you versus active security components here. When we look at this PAM, MFA, IGA, IM, they're very much, and I'm stealing this reference from Okta a little bit, it's building walls, building rules, building guide rails for organizations. Think of it as you build a community, you put stop lights, you put stop signs, you put the WL lines, you put the crosswalks in the community. Very much what these types of tools are focused on across cloud, across Active Directory, across user groups, access and permissions, managing who can do what at scale in an easily done fashion. And it really does make the job of the operation folks a lot easier. But none of that is around focus of security. How do I detect when someone is actively exploiting me? How do I detect when somebody jaywalks or runs a stop sign or runs a red light? Very difficult to do that with these techs natively which is where the ITDDR component has really come in. Being an active police force on networks for organizations to detect when someone is violating these components. Again, with ITDR, I'm not telling you to get rid of this, right? I would never say that. But it's a built upon this to level up organizations, to make them stronger, to know when violators happen. I can't expect 100% compliance from my users, my technology, or for what I expect attackers to do. I know I am notoriously for running yellow lights I think I can make which is a really bad habit. But, you know, sometimes I'm gonna run a red light and I need to be caught and taught a lesson. So, now, Gardner put together this great graphic around this and we break this into a couple key categories, which I think really simplifies the strategies that people want to take here. Um, this also falls in line with what people know around the EDR realm of prevention, detection, and response. And we see over here, IDDR, detection response side, let's focus on that. We see the tools that we just looked at, MFA, AM, IGA, PAM, all on the prevention side. Excellent, good, you want to have those. Prevent what you can prevent. If you can prevent it, it won't be a problem later. Also prevention, also excellent for reducing cost of fixing. If I catch it at an MFA, if it stops it, significantly less expensive to resolve than if I catch it at a latter, latter stage. That doesn't mean we exclude the latter stages though. So we have other tools that we can use this. Uh, UBA, IOCs, indicators of compromise, tactics, techniques, procedures we can use here. But we need to consider that identity threats are bypassing and they're entering into the ITDR realm of what we need to cover. The side that I see a little bit not necessarily fo as focused on is response. And this is where we need to be more thoughtful with the security guys because Security teams spend a lot of money. They really do. I want to make sure that I'm using tools that they've already invested. I want to work in conjunction with this. So for example, if I have a response and I detect something, what is the action out of that? Well, it, people can't just have the hubris of, well, my tool will detect it and that is it and that's all people need. It doesn't work like that for security teams. It doesn't work like that for analyst teams. I want to be able to integrate. How do I send alerting to my SIM? How do I send this to my analyst team? Better yet, how do I send information to my analyst team that they know what they're actually supposed to do in response to it? They don't deal with identity threats every day. It's not common for them yet. 
So how do I recover? How do I report? And how do I remediate those elements here? Also, too, on the ops guys, is there a standard Windows AD configuration for identity that you use across all your jobs? Yes, no? I'm seeing a lot of head shaking of no's here. But there really just isn't. There's no template that you can use. And so everyone is different and unique. So when it comes to reporting, when it comes to remediating, when it comes to recovering, it's all customized response, customized action. And we need to deal with something that I just oh, hate talking about. We need to deal with the business units, right? Because they're always going to have a reason why you can't do something secure, why you can't do something easy, why you can't do something the right way because of a business reason tied to revenue, tied to operations, tied to some legacy protocol that you're stuck still using. We need to talk with them. So how to respond to those elements with the BU concerns as well. Only things that people in your guys' shoes will understand and know about. So we need to consider this component heavily right over here when we talk about these steps. Complex has some thoughts around this too on things that you can actionably do as part of this. One thing I like to always talk about is the hygiene, the basics on this. Being able to understand, am I doing things to um, basic configuration elements here? Not just accepting the defaults, but actually going through and selecting elements that are gonna be good for my organizations. Very basic and simple things too. You don't need to tie it to your framework or really necessarily a checklist, but common sense elements. So think, can guest users in Azure, can they invite other external users to my organization? By default, that is enabled. We should turn that off, right? And there's a big bevy of lists out there that you're for free. You don't need to pay anybody for them. I'll just checklist of things to go through across Active Directory Azure as well. Think about um, non-admins being able to create computer objects. Very easy to turn off. Some of these are actually entirely, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not unviewable by standard users. If you make any of these changes, they wouldn't impact user experience at all. And so these types of basic Concerns are easily done and executed. You don't need to wait for heavy duty change windows. You can do them quickly and you can really step up your security across the board. But on the other side too, we need to be able to start looking at the attack detection side and guidance and response. There's actually a lot of great information in window event log. If you work with the SOC, if you're on the security side of the house, looking at windows event log is, is great for a lot of this stuff. Be able to look at things like process inspection, 46, 88, a wealth of information is available in the around looking for invocation of Mimi cats, of WinPs, of a lot of different tools that are out there. And it's very simple to run regexes across those types of tooling. If you're interested in some scripts, things we want to use here, configuration items, absolutely reach out to me after this call or this talk, and we can talk about it. I'm happy to share some scripts with you. But being able to identify this. The other side here on a credential is credential theft. Being aware of have my passwords been leaked? There's some free sites, there is some tooling out there you can purchase around BNC that does my domain exist in any breach list? And looking on a interval basis to see has that list changed? If it has changed, who was it? And can I look back into Active Directory and see when was the last time someone changed their password? Because if I do that, well then, that password that's already been leaked is no longer an issue or concern. And you can mark that as done. So very easy things to do here on this, on both freeware, tools, as well as some things you can of course purchase for this time. When it comes to guidance response, there's a lot of great information out there around looking for some of these things. So PowerShell scripts, guidance and remediation elements, some great stuff from Windows uh, themselves on GitHub you can absolutely talk about. But things are also, you should be practicing and working on uh, from an operational side on the security side and as well for the infrastructure side. Think about who rolls their KRB TGT every six months. Does anyone do this? One hand. Microsoft recommends that you do it every six months. These types of basic hygiene items and things that you should be prepared to do. Also too, if you need to, or maybe you have a breach and this is a required step you have, your teams need to be prepared and practiced in this operation in the first place. Because if you're not practiced in this, how do you make sure this is gonna work, that you know how to do it, that your teams can do it quickly, especially in a case where maybe your domain has been owned or an administrative account has been compromised. We wanna make sure we cover that as well. Uh, let's see here. So on-prem, we want to be able to be aware of these things. Now there are some compliance elements we can roll into help detecting what's going on here. So a great example of this would be PCI DSS. For uh, if you process credit card payments, 
your behold in a PCI. Being able to monitor and track things in both Active Directory via Windows Event Log is an excellent strategy for looking at on-prem components too. So monitoring administrative accounts for changes for sensitive groups, being able to define in your SIMs of what are my sensitive groups and being aware of what sensitive groups are. This is where good communication from the infrastructure side to the security team works out really well of you guys, infrastructure, being able to define what is an important group. Don't let security folks dictate entirely what is important. Don't also, don't say everything is important because that's not a worthwhile exercise to go through. But every organization has customized their Active Directory or their identity system in a way to know what is actually valuable, what is important we need to watch, and being able to provide that communication to the security folks to actually respond to it, valuable, excellent steps. Being able to look at my cloud component too, making sure I'm ingesting that logging and be able to look for components of that. So whether it's AWS, if it's Google or Azure, tracking those items. And then also too, looking at insights and summaries of issues and then also how can I remediate those elements. And also working with infrastructure and security ops to be able to talk about what is appropriate response and how to respond and who do I invoke for this. So ultimately really the development of playbooks of if XYZ happens, how do I respond to it? Who do I talk to? What issue do I need to email? What teams do I need to engage? Those are all important components. The assume breach part of the detect side, I love, right? Because you need to be able to constantly detect or assume that your network is compromised. So assume you're breached and assume that you wanna be able to detect someone's actually in there. So make sure you know and understand what are your sensitive accounts? Where do they exist? Where do they lie? What groups or what users have access to sensitive groups that would empower them? Think shadow admins or risk in inherency where someone may be a member of a group of a group of a group that ultimately gives them a high level approach we need to identify or access to data that we wanna concern. We wanna be able to run through this exercise to identify if do I have exposure there and how I can identify and find those things out. So we wanna be able to manage those elements too. These all focus back to the zero trust component. How do I detect these types of elements? We hear talk about golden ticket attacks, silver, diamond, sapphire, manipulation of the authorization process. We also talk about credential abuse at the cloud level. As people look and tie ADFS back to cloud identities and people often will use Active Directory as a core component for their broader identity strategy. So if you work with a, a ping, right, great vendor that's here, oftentimes you would see Active Directory as an underlying element of this. So we want to be able to detect when these types of components are being abused. So whether that's looking for encryption type downgrades, whether that's looking for uh, RC4 ciphers being used, which are all things you can find in varied degrees of logging. And then the response component too, and we covered this at a high level already, but here's just some tactical knowledge where you guys can use here. But Again, understanding that not everyone understands both sides of the house. We need to have better communication across the board about these elements. So, um, ops talking to security, security talking to ops around what they need to do, or even really considering the identity component as an ancillary operation component of the security team. The attacks are complicated. They're multi-staged. You're gonna have to work together with a lot of different components knowing where to go, where they are in the environment is important. Also too, having the PowerShell scripts to start enumerating and identifying these things too. How do I start fixing these things at scale? Especially if you work with organizations or you're part of an organization that has, you know, tens of thousands of identities of managed objects, things like this. You can't do this click by click by click. Even if you have a team of 100 interns, you won't be able to do this. But being familiar with the PowerShell commands around this is important and be able to operationalize that with playbooks by putting together the actual remediation response of this. If you're interested in some playbooks, I'm sorry, uh, PowerShell scripts around this, again, talk to me after the call. I spend too much time on Zoom. After this talk, and we can talk about it. So, in summary, I think it's my last slide. Yeah. In summary, right, attackers are focusing on identities. They simply are. Um, there's a great blog article I wrote not too long ago around how we see reuse of malware and identity components being layered on it. The thread I was looking at was Iced ID, which was very popular three, four years ago. We also see expansion of ITDR to include prevent, detect, and response, which is following the same security premises that we see from our EDR brothers. Get visibility into configurations. Let's look at the core components of identity, the OEM hygiene of this. How can we baseline ourselves and then also move beyond standard configuration and defaults into a better security posture? Don't accept defaults as the norm. We wanna move beyond that and then being able to detect, detect simple attacks, 
detect identity attacks, detect credential de attacks from a variety of tooling of not just logging, of correlated rules in SIMS, looking for brute force, password spraying, and then advanced tooling, which is also always available and out there too, on not just the identity layer, the attack surface layer, and beyond. Anyway, thank you so much for my call or talk. Uh, open to questions from anyone at, as we go through this. Yes. The back door? Oh, this one? Here? Oh. So backdoor is coming in um, the, back, <laughs> the back way. Persistence is someone's in the network and they're trying to establish long-term component. I consider backdoor detection as I want to detect someone coming in non-standard routes. Persistence is I want to long-term establish myself in the network and then maintain that posture longer. So that would be me coming in via backdoor method. And then also too, I want to recreate myself my own identity in the environment. So that way I'm persistent in the network via legitimate credentialed user for a longer period of time. That way it's harder to detect me. And if that backdoor changes, evolves, or someone detects it, then I'm still good, right? So the, you see people doing things like infecting backups, long-term persistence techniques, um, or even sells elevator rights or permissions into groups as a way to do that. Yes. Can you say the part, the last part? Identity governance network. Mm -hmm. I don't see on threat response team really focusing on IGA technologies a lot. So did tech or connect the identity threat I, I don't see IGA as a component of security work. I see it as a, a foundational hygiene element for organizations. So ensuring baseline configurations and the standard elements and tenets of IGA as a baseline that we use to establish just a secure component to deal with. I wouldn't consider it part of ITDR, but is a foundational element of just basic security hygiene across networks too. Just the same way that you would do basic hardening steps. Yes. as part of the response component? Depends like if they can catch those signals in the first place too. A lot of the tools, and you gotta think about the foundational data elements of where that information comes from and if that's available or exposed to IGA tooling. So standard stuff like a user is added to a privileged group and you wanna remove it, that's a very basic signal that people can key off of via window event log that's readily available, easy to do. If IGA can do that, and the tool you're using, excellent. Absolutely enable that type of stuff. When it comes to more advanced layer attacks, so think uh, a golden or silver ticket component, those aren't logged. Those are notoriously difficult to detect. There's not a core logging component that actually has an event that you can even key off of. So IGA tooling tends to fall flat when it kind of comes to those components too. Certainly part of an IGA strategy would be to involve that component, but detection of those components are just very difficult. Anybody else? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate your time and attention today. And uh, Complex, we're, what booth number are we? 1314. We're right next to Silverfort. Come by. Love to talk to you guys, okay? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>